ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for standing by, and uh, thanks for joining us today. The CHRS is very happy to welcome today's speakers, Dr. Christopher Lane from the Royal Jubilee Hospital in Victoria, and Dr. Katya Dirda from the Montreal Heart Institute, who will be presenting on ablation in Brugada syndrome and electromagnetic interference. Uh, during the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Thursday, June 26, 2014. I would now like to turn the conference over to Dr. Katya Dirda. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, as it combines both my first life as an engineer and my second life as an electrophysiologist. So I will say a few things tonight about electromagnetic interference and implantable medical devices, primarily pacemakers and defibrillators that we work with on a regular basis. Um, just so you know, I am a consultant for Hydro Quebec, so we do a lot of work on EMI that is sponsored by them. I've also done work with other uh, power uh, corporations. So is it a myth or reality in 2014? Uh, you will find out. Will it affect your patients? That is also something that we'll touch on. And, but primarily what you want to know is whether or not it will cause harm. What I want to accomplish tonight is just review quickly the basic principles of EMI, understand what the device can do as a response to it, and recognize some of the current sources of EMI. Uh, there's a tremendous number of them out there. I'll focus on things that I've asked questions about most recently in uh, various clinics, as I hope those are most relevant uh, to your practice as well. And then I'll slide a few words at the end about some ways to decrease the risk. So what is EMI? It is simply interference of device function caused by an external signal to the device. It can come from electric field, from magnetic field, some RF uh, fields. Those are the main ones in our area of work, as well as radiation. But there's also microwave and acoustic range uh, fields that can cause trouble with some other devices in the medical field. What are the variables that will impact uh, or have a role to play. Basically, the power of the source emitting the fields, the distance the field uh, or, or the source is from the device implanted, how long it lasts, so is it a continuous application or is it a slick, cyclical application? If it is cyclical, what frequency does it operate at? Then the orientation. So if you're thinking of someone standing under a power line, well, are they lying down or are they standing up, are they sideways, as the feel that the device will feel, will feel especially uh, the area contained by the pacemaker leads or the defibrillator leads, will be affected by that. Then we look at modulations and the, so the way the field is delivered and then the immunity of the device itself to all of it. From the, ver from the device itself, there's also a number of variables that will affect it. So the number and the position of the leads, also the way we program the device, so sensitivity, the polarity, the modes that we uh, select, how we set up our, our periods, blanket periods and refractory periods primarily, and then also the design uh, inherent to the various models, principally the filters, the shielding, and uh, the read switch, which is the switch that can be affected by a magnet. Uh, it is of relevance not to take you through the picky details of how the devices are constructed, but to understand that that is key in the newer devices that are now MRI compatible as they have gotten rid of this switch, which could be affected in the past. So what happens to our devices? Uh, we can have individual components that fail. We can have a reset of the device to some factory mode for uh, the initial programming. We can have changes in the programmable parameters. We can change the mode of operation. We can have false alarms, which should not be underestimated because those still frighten the patients tremendously and make them uh, very nervous uh, about their device and lead to frequent hospital visits. The device can also stop working the way it's intended or it can start working in the way that is unintended. 
And again, and also, sorry, we can have distortion of the signal and artifacts introduced, leading to difficulties in interpretation of signals. So what are common sources that we hear about? Uh, as I said, the list is quite exhaustive, but I've just put a few here. Um, MRI is something that comes up frequently. We deal with it. Uh, we have to make decisions about whether or not to allow patients to have MRI scans more and more frequently. Electrostatic discharge um, is also something that we uh, have to face, especially with more and more uh, recycled plastics being used. There are all, a number of large structures of ma are made of this, and they build up an immense amount of charge, and you can get actually quite a good shock from it. Phones uh, lead to questions. Uh, music players, your laptop, your iPads, all of those devices that we carry with us in our pockets and purses, so very close to the body or to the device. And then also uh, all of the security systems and the identification devices that we have uh, in a lot of areas that we go through. And last but not least, is household magnets, which are now used uh, in a number of different things, including clothing, to hold clothing in place, your security badges, all of the key code access uh, badges, all may lead to uh, have very strong magnets in them. So let's walk through a few uh, of these things more in, in more detail. And uh, at the end, if you have questions, I'll be happy about the things that I present or about other sources of EMI, I'll be happy to answer them. So power lines are frequently a concern. Uh, more and more there are parks and other developments, sort of uh, bicycle trails, walking trails that are under development under power lines, and that does raise concern. Uh, there have been a few studies, a quite recent one published in 2012, looking at pacemakers under uh, high electric field and magnetic fields directly under the lines. And this was not made, these were uh, in vitro studies, but with a phantom that was quite representative of a human being, a human torso. And what they found is that only uh, devices programmed in unipolar mode were still vulnerable. When everything, when the same device was set to bipolar mode, there was no concern. So that is, uh, again, only in vitro studies, but quite reassuring. When it comes to ICDs, uh, there has not been a similar study done. However, there has been a, um, sorry, there's not been an in vivo study. It has been extensive. What was done is by the uh, French utility group uh, led by Dr. Souk. They took all of the employees who were working for the French utilities and who were uh, equipped with an ICD, and they walked them through their entire work areas to see what exposures they were under and whether or not there would be any interference with their devices. And the uh, very reassuring fact is that there was absolutely no interference noted uh, with the ICDs in all three cases. Now, those were three employees that worked at that different function would be taken through different areas, so uh, variable exposures, and no uh, problems arose. I bring up tasers uh, a little bit because of this comment about electrostatic discharge earlier. This, the electrostatic discharge, discharge sorry, has been looked at. Uh, it is not published yet. Uh, there's a group in Finland working on this. But the taser is sort of the closest thing I could find to give you a little bit of the idea of an intense shock delivery, uh, except for a cardio version. Uh, but we'll get to that a bit later. But Tasers can deliver uh, peak voltages that are very high, 1,000 to 1,500 volts all in, one, in, in an instant. And the ICDs did sense them, but, and they, but because they were so short that they were just seen as a simple intrinsic cardiac beat or as a rapid noise signal. So um, in theory, it should not be a problem. However, there have been some case reports that showed inappropriate rapid pacing as a result and inappropriate VF sensing. Fortunately, in the case reports, there were no inappropriate shocks that resulted from that. Smart meters uh, are a big topic. I don't know about other provinces, but I know in Quebec uh, they are being implemented by our utility company, and the question comes up oftentimes whether or not it is going to become a problem. Um, we know that there is 
uh, in theory, a risk for devices that operate in 2.4 gigahertz. However, um, in order to alleviate some of the fears, some work was done in collaboration with Hydro-Quebec, and what we found is that a number of different smart meters were tested with a number of Medtronic devices, and what we found is that there was no interference with the functioning of the devices when they were placed uh, between 6 and 15 centimeters uh, from the uh, smart meter. There was transmission occurring at the time. There was communication with the different devices. Uh, telemetry was not sort of active. Telemetry was not tested, but function and transmission of the smart meter was tested uh, during uh, this experiment. Security systems uh, bring up a lot of questions. Our patients are called to do various day-to-day -day tasks or go through, uh, so they have to go through security gates in front of uh, shops. Also, when they're traveling through uh, airports or other uh, security gates, there are different types. The handheld metal detectors, which operate uh, in a continuous wave range. So a continuous signal is certainly less of a concern than a uh, fluctuating pulsed signal. But so the handheld ones are the, sort of the bat bat batons that can be used and swept over uh, a, uh, a person walking. And the walk-through metal detectors are the ones with the two large plates that you walk through. And these ones operate in a different frequency range. Uh, but the key is that the majority are pulsed um, and will provide in general, much greater magnetic field strength than the handheld ones. So some, uh, a number of devices were looked at, both pacemakers and ICDs, uh, very widely used handheld metal detectors and uh, security systems were looked at, programmed to max uh, intensity. They were swept directly over the patient's the cardiac apex and were kept over the device for greater than 30 seconds. So that should be enough time to cause symptoms or cause uh, a problem. And in the end, no changes in device function was observed. So this is very reassuring, um, especially for security. Uh, a number of patients need to be reassured before walking through security. We still should advise them to let security guards, especially at the airport, to carry their card, the device card, and let People know that they have a device, but I think that the risk has decreased significantly over the years. The electronic article surveillance system, uh, this pertains to the uh, tags that are put on the items in the store themselves. These are in a talking mode, if you like, with pylons in the stores so that uh, the store knows where the items are and if they are being taken out without the tag in the item being deactivated, an alarm will sound. So you, oftentimes we are walking through a field because of communication between the tag and the, the pylon and uh, this may be of concern. However, uh, there were a number of um, devices tested through the years. So this study looked at uh, what we're looking at from 1999 to 2006, so, and again, a retrospective study looking at 16 years of operation over the different types of systems, and there hasn't been any interaction that would cause problems. Uh, some of them were prolonged exposures up to two minutes. Some of them were shorter exposures. Uh, so in these studies, there was nothing reported. However, uh, I know that there have been case reports of someone, a, a patient, standing by one of these gates, in fact, leaning on the gate, and we have some interactions have been noted. So it's still important to tell our patients to walk through the gates, walk through, uh, so the, those are the gates if they are situated at the store door or wherever they are, but to not linger in an area where there might be some exposure. RFID systems are uh, the radio frequency identification systems. Those are used more and more as an uh, inventory um, tool for 
hospitals, for manufacturers, for stores. So basically a reader similar the size of your iPhone or some handheld uh, scanner can communicate with tags on the, on the specific items. Again, relatively large fields are uh, emitted. Uh, there have been no incident reports to the FDA associated with RFID, but there's not been um, extensive work done with them. And there have been some reports of reactions depending on the type of RFID system. There is no uh, standard RFID system that is accepted for all hospital use uh, to date. Cell phones are things that we often get questions about. Um, the earlier phones were problematic because they had a much larger battery. They emitted uh, much, higher, much higher power. Sorry, they required much higher power to function. Uh, so there were some interactions with the pacemakers. Uh, we used to tell patients, always use a contralateral hand, never store your cell phone in your coat pocket. The newer devices, the mobile phones that are currently in use, use much lower powers, power now, and it is not felt to be an issue. The recommendations still hold. Uh, I think it's always safer to tell your patients to teach them the habit of keeping all devices away, but uh, with respect to a simple cell phone or even your, the newer smartphones, uh, there is not a concern at this stage based on studies done or recent case reports. With respect to ICDs, uh, again, uh, there were there's an older study that I found. I haven't seen anything that's really uh, recent looking specifically at ICDs. Back in 2005, there were some of the a number of phones that were still on the market or still in use at higher powers. Um, however, there were no changes in ICD function detected uh, at that time during this study. Uh, so that is very reassuring. However, what I said earlier, we still recommend maintaining distance from the device to the phone. What about all of the new uh, series of digital listening devices, so combining our cell phone to our iPod into your smartphones, all of those things. The original uh, iPod did cause some concern with a pacemaker causing high atrial and high ventricular being sensed. However, uh, a follow-up study looking at different types of devices looking for much longer period of time with and without telemetry wand, so during active communication with the pacemaker, or uh, we showed that there was telemetry interference. However, this did not, um, sorry, but there was no uh, interference when the wand was removed, and this did not lead to problems clinically. And again, once things were programmed in bipolar mode and with the newer devices with more effective filters, uh, the risk was felt to be negligible. This dates back to 2009. Uh, again, things have evolved. So in theory, the risk is small. However, we still should advise our patients to keep a distance. I mentioned PDAs, uh, 2004, so the original devices, higher power than what we have right now. Anything that was tested in that study showed no effect of EMI. By no effect uh, during these types of studies meant no clinical effect, and if something was seen, there was certainly no impact on the programming of the device and no clinical relevance to it. What about laptop computers? Um, more recently, a case report uh, looking at a patient who was working on his laptop and lying in bed and fell asleep. Laptop was directly against the defibrillator, and this, this caused a switch to magnet mode. Uh, you may or may not be aware that the batteries and the power supplies in your computer system contain uh, act as a relatively large magnet, and this is sufficient to cause a switch to magnet mode. So again, caution, 
keep your distance away from your device. So we have to tell our patients, work on your computer, work on your laptop, but do not have it on your chest. Especially, don't have it close to you in a position where you might fall asleep and lean against it. This is particularly true and more of concern when it comes to iPads. Uh, more recently, in 2014, um, this work was done uh, by a large number of people who are involved with Apple following a concern that, they, that was reported to them where they looked at 27 patients with ICDs and they found that when the, the iPad was held at reading distance or placed directly over the device with the iPad uh, active or not, so cellular data capability activated or not, um, there were 33%, so nine patients, for whom mind mode uh, occurred. This, all of these interactions occurred not when the iPad was a bit further away, but when it was directly over the device. The big cause for concern there, again, is the magnetic. The cover holder contains a magnet, and that's a magnet that is strong enough to tell the device to switch off when you close it, so you can imagine that the strength of this magnet is also felt by your uh, implanted device. So patients have to be very careful. Uh, very few people now carry their laptop on their chest. However, iPads are quite prevalent, and we see uh, walking on the streets. Now that the days are beautiful, you see a lot of elderly people who are computer savvy walking around reading their papers with their iPads. Um, magnets. Magnets are a big concern. Again, I've mentioned computers. I've mentioned the iPads. Well, these magnets are there are a lot of magnets in different things uh, and that we may not be suspicious of. Uh, a lot of clothing now hold, have magnetic pins to hold the collars in place so they don't flap. Uh, it avoids needing pressing. It avoids a lot of uh, maintenance, but it can lead to problems. Uh, this study, so 2011, looking at small spheres. So we're looking at 8 to 10 millimeters uh, so not very large magnets causing large fields and affecting pacemakers at a distance of 1.7 to 2.1, when they were sort of as close as 1.7 to 2.1 centimeters. Well, if you think of these magnetic um, necklaces that are sold sometime in pharmacy for various medicinal purposes, they would lie directly over an implanted device. Endoscopy. Um, those are quite common. Most of, uh, I've had quite a few questions because the manufacturers of the small bowel uh, endoscopy capsules say you should not uh, use that if a patient has a, a device, pacemaker or a defibrillator. However, uh, there were some original trials done, sort of case reports saying that there were no problems with the pacemaker or defibrillator. The only problems that arose were with the pill cam itself, where some images were lost. So patients underwent the test, and unfortunately part of the data was not retrievable because of that, the interference. Uh, a larger study was done, and there was no clinically relevant interference noted. Um, they used maximum transmission power, sorry, the maximum transmission power required for the newer pills are now below what is uh, the limit for the cardiac devices. So it's not a concern for our pacemakers. Uh, the telemetry itself can cause problem with the capsule recording. So if those tests are to be done in patients with devices, we just have to make sure that we don't actually interrogate their devices while their pill, their pill cam is still inside them. Cardioversion. Um, I think that in today's age, uh, it's much less of a concern than with the older devices. Um, we, if people have, if we have any concerns, if they have older devices, I think that it's still smart to interrogate the device after, but it's no longer the, uh, the common practice to interrogate everybody after a cardioversion. Um, especially if you have any concerns, if you have any uh, abnormal ECGs, or if you have any concerns about uh, the device, 
then be safer, interrogate, but it is not something that is commonly practiced uh, for across the board following a cardioversion now. I will skip uh, to sorry the radiation because these are case by case. There is still a concern with high fields, uh, and it's n most hospitals that do radiation therapy have a team that consults with the electrophysiologist as to what to do with the devices. Often they can be relocated, but there are strict protocols to be followed. And MRIs, MRIs are also complex uh, devices. They contain multiple fields. Uh, a static field, a gradient field, and an RF field. The RF is the fluctuating one. There's many, many studies, most of them uh, looking at specific aspects, seeing some concerns with the original devices. Nothing, uh, a, a lot of things were felt to be underreported. However, more recently, we, there have been the advent of conditional pacemakers, the conditional ICDs. Uh, we have gone through some studies. We've gone through very positive results. The general agreement is that no matter the system, if the MRI is deemed essential, it can be done with special measures in place. However, it is not something that we should do uh, without a proper setup, that it should be done with a lot of care, preparation, especially making sure that if an MRI conditional system is in place, that it truly is a full system. So if there is a concern of questions, then uh, consult a team that has more experience doing it, that has a protocol in place uh, for this. Um, I'll just take you through the take-home message as time is running fast. So potential for EMI with the implantable devices is not a myth in 2014. Devices that can be effective are part, that can cause our EMI, are part of our daily life. The, myth, the risk varies. It is very difficult to estimate a percentage of risk to give to our patients. Um, there are some recommendations. De decisions must be individualized, especially if we're talking about return to work to uh, areas that might be more risky. But it's always better to be safe than sorry, so avoid unnecessary exposure and always encourage people to keep the distance between their device and their uh, sorry, whatever device, the implanted device, and whatever field exposure they may be uh, seeing. So this is it for now. If there are some questions, I can gladly take them, although time is a little bit shorter because of our technical difficulties in the beginning. Uh, if we don't have time, you can also post them on the chat, and I can answer them at a later date uh, as well.